what I'm saying is in a real world context, things don't quite work like that. So for example, let's say you had an amount of butter in a jar, in a pot and you had another amount of, uh, oh, I've got to start again now. Oh yeah, one, two, one, two. Welcome to this blog. Now press that button there, which allows me to track my focus because I didn't do that last time. And then every time I brought my hands up, it uh, kind of changed focus, which was annoying. Welcome to this blog. Later on in this blog, I'm going to have Mike Kidson joining me. I'm currently in Brighton at the Brighton Centre, another venue I played with uh, Dean Howard, Ricky's dad, back in the day, um, supporting Deep Purple. It was a lovely gig here. As I said in the last blog, my mum came along and that was um, a surprise, which was excellent in every way and Mike's going to be joining me um, tomorrow. Um, I'm going to record a bit that I'm going to put on the end of this blog with Mike Kidson in Bournemouth. Um, that's the plan anyway, um, to talk about an album that he introduced me to that I absolutely love and everyone should listen to it and get into it. It's amazing. But let's uh, go through other things that uh, I need to talk about. So I've made a list because people have asked questions and there's other things I want to talk about, I have to say, please subscribe to my channel. I don't make any money out of it. You know, I haven't got any sponsors or anything like that, at least not on these videos. Um, so please subscribe, please click the bell notification and please you know, share my blog if you find it interesting with people. I will be doing some videos where I play guitar and stuff when I get home and back to normal service. But while I'm out on the road, I thought I'd uh, try doing this blogging thing instead. So um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm very clumsy. That's one thing I want to talk about. I'm very, very clumsy on stage, um, well, clumsy in general, but on stage, uh, I would say two to three times a night when I'm taking a guitar off, I whack myself in the face with it. Um, I've got all sorts of like under here, little pressure points that are like little bruises that I can feel where I whack myself in the head. I walk up to my mic and hit myself in the face with the mic. As I'm taking guitars off, I hit the end of my mic. You have people in the crowd every now and again here, like, boo, sort of like a bang noise and that's me hitting the microphone with the headstock of the guitar in the dark because I'm I, I'm amazed I can play guitar to be honest I'm so clumsy and so uncoordinated that it's a surprise that I can um, use my fingers so dexterously if that's the word um, <clears throat> so yeah uh, clumsiness is definitely um, something I'm always tripping over my feet um, so yeah, I, I had that in uh, Soundcheck Today, which is why I'm bringing it up. I thought that was quite funny. In Soundcheck Today, I went to pass a guitar to John and the bit of my 58 Strat that's like the horn there, whacked me in the face and I was like, oh no, like that. And I'm always walking into tables, hit my knees on things under a table and I'm absolutely useless with this stuff. And I'm sure this is gonna to build to something which I'll talk about in another blog. But there are reasons why I'm like that. But um, so there we go. Um, Someone asked me how do I remember all the songs and how I learn songs, someone asked that question. Well, um, I don't know, I've got an exceptionally good memory. That is something that, um, you know, particularly for technical things and numbers and, um, you know, dates of things and lists of things and stuff like that. I've got an exceptionally good memory for that stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then how I remember songs, I mean, a lot of it's just, just practice, but realistically it's not remembering whole sequences of notes. It's remembering certain patterns that you learn as a certain lick and then you learn another lick. And then when you hear them, you know it's that lick. So it's not like I've got 10 notes and 10 more notes and I've got to remember them. It's like remembering lick one and lick two and putting them next to each other. And then after a while, it just becomes muscle memory. But the thing that I've always said to people when they're trying to, let's say, learn a whole list of songs, um, and they're, they're going, how do I learn like 80 songs? It's, it's just such a, such a mammoth task. And I say, learn them in chronological order. Because let's say you were joining a pub band and they had a list of kind of classic rock songs from you know, the early 60s through to say, you know, up till now. Um, if you learn the stuff from the early 60s first, by the time you get to the late 60s, you realize that they're using the same licks, but there's one note changed. And then when you get to the early 70s, you realize they're using the stuff from the late 60s with a couple of notes changed. So you're kind of learning more stuff in, in the same sort of chronological way that people at the time kind of listened to what came before and then added a little bit to it and whatever. So if you're faced with a huge catalog of material that you need to learn in a short space of time, just put all the songs in chronological order um, and then within 
you know periods that you've got then make this you know make it the simplest one you learn first and then work yourself up like that and and it will be a lot easier because then when you're learning say song number 40 on the list you'll be like oh song number 40 is the same as this other song but they've just added this in and they're doing that and they've swapped it around you start to see patterns between different songs and actually you're not learning every song as its own distinct thing it just becomes a melee of stuff and before you know it you can hear something on the radio and go oh that does that in the solo and just pick up a guitar and play it without really having to think about it you know and there's plenty of songs I hear and I hear a guitar solo on and I think I know that if as long as I know what key the song's in I could just pick up guitar and play it without even having to actually work it out or put any effort in so um <clears throat> that was that's my advice there is learning chronological order and um don't think that you're trying to learn a whole song you're 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 just play it and practice it and learn it in chunks and then it becomes remembering a chunk rather than remembering the whole thing so um that's how it works for me someone else might be different um someone mentioned about taking vitamins or as americans say vitamins uh to sort out my muscular problems. I have tried that stuff in the past. It's never done anything for me. The most healthy I ever felt with terms of not having aches and pains and everything was when I went completely meat only and I ate only meat um, for about two months and I didn't have any veg, any fruit, no carbs whatsoever, nothing like that. I only drank water and pretty much just ate steak and um, pork and lamb <coughs> for about two months. I started off with meat and greens on the diet and then I moved to pretty much just meat. And that is the best I've ever felt in terms of not having any aches and pains or anything like that. Um, I've tried the vitamin route, I've taken them every now and again, they've, they've, they've made no difference to my life at all. And I remember a doctor once saying, well if you take vitamin supplements all you end up with is expensive piss. And um, I know there are people out there that say, oh, they're, they're really essential. And they are essential if you've got a vitamin deficiency, but I don't believe I, you know, I, I, with my diet and the country I live in and whatever, you know, but there's loads of vitamins and all the stuff. I mean, I eat quite a bit of fruit and I eat, I do eat pretty decently compared to what people expect because I only ever post when I'm eating takeaways and stuff. But, you know, I do have a a fairly good diet in terms of eating fruit and veg and stuff like that. There are certain veg that I really enjoy and certain fruit I really enjoy. And I think I've, I've more than enough vitamins, you know. Um, I've never had a blood test and it tell me that um, I've got a deficiency in anything. So, um, yeah, I can't see myself suddenly, uh, you know, going down to Holland and Barrett every other day and, and feeding their pseudo-scientific bullshit um, corporate machine with my cash. That ain't gonna happen, I'm afraid. Um, but thank you for the advice. Um, I think a little bit more stretching and exercising would definitely help. Um, I think a lot of it is just psychological stress and um, my own various psychological issues, which is another thing I'll probably get to in a, in a later uh, podcast at some point and uh, you know, links with the clumsiness. Hello everyone. Uh, just a very, very quick one because here I am in Brighton. I wanted to add a story, um, so I'm going to be snipping this bit in. I realised I hadn't told the uh, the story, just make sure it's in focus, yeah, I hadn't told the uh, story about when I was here on the Deep Purple tour um, and I sort of met Jimmy Page, if you could call it meeting him. Um, so he was here at the Deep Purple gig and uh, when I came off stage, I was walking back to the dressing room and he was standing there was like a vending machine that did tea and stuff like that and he was standing there with the photographer Ross Halfin who you may or may not have heard of but was yeah he's been kissing Jimmy Page's ass for many years um, and I don't know him at all and I don't know Jimmy but as I was walking up this corridor towards them Jimmy Page kind of elbowed Ross Halfin and uh, Ross Halfin walked up the corridor towards me and basically tried to put his hand on my shoulder and stop me and say give him some space mate to which my um, response was, I don't give a fuck about him and I don't give a fuck about you. I want to get to my dressing room, which you're standing outside. I want to get a cup of tea and go in my dressing room, if that's okay. And I showed him my pass, which obviously was an access all areas, and his was just a guest pass. And it's like, arrogant fucker thinks that, that the only reason I'd be walking along that corridor is to hassle Jimmy Page because I'm going to be such a fan. And I just, 
that was the first time that I kind of met someone of rock royalty that I thought was a total twat. Mike's sitting next to me listening to this while I'm saying it. Hey. So, um, thanks for that one, Mike. That's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my Jimmy Page story. And John Paul, my friend John Paul, who was also here on that tour, he was playing Hammond with us, heard this older Rickenbacker that um, he'd been getting various artists to sign. And um, Lemmy had signed it. We'd met Lemmy in Birmingham and he'd signed it. And it kind of got a braddle and was like scratching people's signature. And all these different people had been had signed it from the 60s because John Paul... Is, is kind of um, obsessed with 60s music and he got all these different artists signed and it clearly wasn't one of these guitars that you're going to put on eBay and sell or whatever. This was a, a collection and he went up to Jimmy Page very politely and showed him this guitar and said, look, I've got this, I've got all these 60s artists on it. Please, will you sign it? It would mean so much to me. And Jimmy Page said, I don't sign guitars. People just sell them on eBay. He said, but clearly I'm not because I've been collecting this my whole life. This is personal. It's got all these different signatures. He said, and he said, it's even got uh, Jim McCarty and another guy, which I can't remember the name of. You'll be able to fill in, Mike. But we're in the Yardbirds, Jimmy. Even got your old bandmates. And he, Jimmy Page kind of looked down and saw their signatures and went, I vaguely remember those people and just walked off. Arrogant fucker. <laughs> what a total asshole. So that happened at the Brighton Centre, both those two incidents, one which I was involved with and one of which I witnessed with John Paul. And I just wanted to stick that story in because I thought, you know, it would be silly to not recall that here. It would be silly to recall that story in uh, Bournemouth tomorrow when it actually happened in Brighton. So um, back to the main video now, snipping in over. Goodbye from Mike. <laughs> snipping over. Okay, someone here said, how did I join Aussie Floyd? That's, uh, that's a good one. So, um, so yeah, a guy that I used to know um, who I no longer speak to for various reasons, and I'm certainly not going into that, but um, he invited me out to see the Aussie Floyd across three dates. I used to own a computer company in that day, uh, back in those days, and uh, you know I was sitting in an office, so he invited me along to uh, see the Aussie Floyd in three dates in a row, and we were in a Winnebago. That was in 2009, August 2009. It was really cool to just you know travel across Europe and see these three gigs at festivals, and hang with the band and there were some tensions within the band at the time which actually led to the you know the reason that there was a vacancy and I actually ended up joining um, and because of that um, you know there were various people that from the band that were hanging out on the in the Winnebago that we were traveling in rather than being on the tour buses and um, that was that was great fun. They supported Ozzy Floyd uh, again before I was in it. They supported Deep Purple at this festival they were on before Deep Purple, and I know Bonnie wanted to meet um, Summer Deep Purple because I toured with them. I actually emailed Roger Glover and said, "Hey, we're going to be at the same festival. You know, I'm here with Ozzy Floyd. You know, I'd love to meet you and whatever." And Roger replied very very quickly and said, "Hey, Dave, yeah, cool, come by and introduce and whatever." And I actually stood at the side of the stage with Roger Glover on that festival watching Ozzy Floyd and we were chatting away um, and he said with your style playing you could be in this band I went well one day you never know and of course as it happens it turned out that I did so um, when a vacancy came up I'm not a spokesperson for the band so I'm not giving the band history here but when um, a vacancy came up within the band I got a phone call from Steve because I'd already you know, sent him things of me playing guitar or whatever, and uh, he invited me up to jam, and I went up and jammed with the band twice. I know some other people did, I don't know who they were, um, but I got the gig, and really it was quite a life change, because I was, you know, had a recording studio and rehearsal room that I ran. I also had my IT business, which had stacks of customers and like six or seven employees, as well as freelancers. Ah, oh, Mike's just coming in, even though his bit is happening tomorrow. Uh, I'm just doing a blog, Mike. Say hello. Oh, hi there. <laughs> so um, I'll finish this point uh, before I before I bring off here. So that was that, really. They invited me up, and I, you know, got the gig. How you doing, Mike? All right. I was just telling them that later on in the blog, probably filmed tomorrow, you're going to be joining talking about an album, but I'm not giving it away because okay. you've got to watch to the end so you actually hear us uh, hear us talking about it. The mystery album. <clears throat> everyone, everyone will be so excited when they find out what it is. Everyone will be so excited, and that's probably coming up next. Um, Including me. 
Yes, including Mike. So he walked in just at the moment, but we're actually going to film that tomorrow, so it'll be in a different room and a different time, won't it? Hello again. Because he hasn't got a mic on, I'd have to get another mic out to mic up Mike. But you're, you know, Mike. Mike, Mike. Mike, Mike. Mike, Mike. Mike, 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 Mike with Mike, a mic. Mike, Mike, Mike with a mic, yes. Indeed. Right, so this is uh, part one of the blog anyway. Um, and, uh, oh dear, he's making noises. What is that? It's a bass tin whistle. Oh, I've got to turn the camera around now. This this is where we go off the floor. Off the floor, absolutely. Bass tin whistle, folks. There you go, tin whistle, but in big form and much lower in pitch. Nice. Highly exciting. Well, there we go. Would you want to play a little outro tune before you come back on tomorrow with different clothes and whatever? Give us give us something Not to really, no. transition from this bit of the blog to the next bit of the that blog. That would be lovely, although in actual fact it's a bit difficult because with these things, you see you're okay with the left hand, you can put the fingers over the holes with your left hand, with the right hand you can't really reach because it's too long. So you have to do what is known in the trade as the piper's grip. He's holding a microphone in front of my face, either that or he's holding a small black mushroom in front of my face. Well, I've, I've moved, moved the, the microphone, microphone off my top and put it there so ah, that they right, can okay. hear you when you're talking. Yes, okay, so yes, the th left hand, fine. Right hand, not so easy because you've got to use the second and third pads of your fingers instead of the tips, which is what you would normally do. Hmm. Uh, in other words, at this point in time, I can't really get the low notes. Ah. I need to practice. Well, Oops. That's as good as you're going to get for now, folks. Okay, well, see you tomorrow. Try again tomorrow. Might be better by then. Let's go and find my. Damn bonnet. Chris. Ah, oh, here's Mike. Right, let's uh Can't find Mike. He's not died, is he? I don't know.